Well, if and hopefully when San Diego State and SMU join the Pac-12, some people have concerns about them uh, diluting the product, making the conference not as strong and whatnot, but those teams could be more competitive sooner than you think. You are Locked On Pac-12, your daily podcast on the Pac-12 Conference. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Locked on Pac-12. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day, and your number one source to stay up to date with our media rights free and beloved Conference of Champions. I can't change that intro just yet, but you could change the fact that you haven't liked, comment, subscribed, rate, reviewed the show wherever you listen to or watch it. If you haven't done so already, thank you to everybody who has. Today's episode brought to you by Bird Dogs. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on college. They'll throw in a free custom Bird Dogs Yeti style tumbler with every order. Lots to get to, some potential new schools talk. I say potential because we don't have them yet. And then what is FanDuel doing? Besides, you know, being one of our big sponsors, of which we're very grateful for here at the Locked On Network, what exactly are they doing? Yeah, we'll get to that later. And then uh, something about week two that just really catches my eye. So let's start with this. San Diego State and SMU get some pushback amongst Pac-12 fans. And I've had some of you ask me questions about that here on the show because the, the argument that is presented there is a fair one, which is you add G5 schools to your conference, you are not strengthening your conference. You're not creating a better product. You're not you know adding better teams. You're not adding teams that can contend. They're not full media rights earning members. All very fair points to bring up. But I do find the general notion that these teams can never, to, can never compete to be a ridiculous one. Again, I'll go back to my two favorite examples, Utah and TCU. TCU was in the national championship game. Utah, the two-time defending champs, were both once time, once upon a time G5 additions to their Power 5 conference. And they are now, in the world of realignment, two of the biggest brands that exist in those conferences, right? At least that remain. I mean, for the Pac-12, it's probably Oregon and Washington, and then Utah is right there. They've been to the last four full season Pac-12 championship games. They've won two of them, haven't won a Rose Bowl yet, but they're getting up there in TV viewership and they're getting up there in wins and building their reputation. And TCU, same sort of thing without Texas and Oklahoma. Who are the biggest brands left in the Big 12? Uh, TCU is certainly one of them. You cannot argue that fact. So that consideration, I think, should always be factored in. But on the question of when these teams can win conference championships, I, again, am going to go back to the Utes here because the Utes first won a Pac-12 championship breaking through in 2021. They joined the conference in 2011. Let's remove the COVID year because that doesn't count for anything. So 10 seasons, it was in their 10th season that they won a Pac-12 championship. They went to the conference title game in 2018 and 2019. They lost both those times to Washington and Oregon, but getting to those games is still a pretty good, I would say, moniker of, yeah, this was a good addition to the conference. They are adding value here. They are a good team. So let's operate on that timeline first. 2011 to 2018 is when Utah made that appearance in the Pac-12 championship game for the first time. So that took them, you know, seven, eight seasons, uh, you know, depending on how you view like the first year, is it like full adjustment year, is it, you know, yada, yada, yada and such. But Utah not getting there until 2018 took them that long in the pre-portal era. Think about that. We now live in a world of college football in which teams can completely reshape their rosters in a significant, tangible, noticeably impactful way in one 
offseason. Now, I am not saying that if San Diego State and SMU joined the Pac-12, they would add so many transfers that they just wouldn't be able to, or that they'd be able to, you know, contend for a conference championship right away, that it would be immediate, that they'd, you know, already be one of the best teams in the conference. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is the timeline of seven years, eighth season for Utah to get to the Pac-12 championship game could 100% be bumped up for either of those schools because of the portal. It just doesn't take you as long to put together a power five roster. So think about Deion Sanders at Colorado, right? Now, is he a great example for everybody else? No, because nobody has a coach like Deion. But Deion Sanders has added 51 to this point transfer portal players, which is an astonishingly high number. I think we all agree with that. Now, the thing about that is San Diego State's roster and SMU's roster from this past season it probably pretty comparable to what you had at Colorado this past year. Heck, you could even make the argument they would have been better. I don't know if Colorado last year would have had a winning record in the Mountain West. I don't know if that would have happened. I haven't done a deep dive on it. But my guess is they would not have because they were really bad. They got housed by, Colorado, by uh, Air Force. That's a Mountain West team. A good one but they got housed. So I suspect they would have been pretty darn bad. So if you are taking two schools who have more talent on it than Colorado did a year ago, you might not be able to overturn it or turn it over rather at the rate in which the buffs are currently doing. But that sort of model of going to a power five conference from a G5, which Colorado is not doing, but if you did that and the ability to add dozens and dozens of starting caliber day one players right away can reshape how quickly a team can compete at a high level a lot quicker than it used to. Because when you could only add, you know, a couple grad transfers or maybe a portal player here and there, right? A typical recruiting cycle was, you know, 20 to 30 freshmen coming in and, you know, some kids go out and you maybe have like four or five transfers. You can now bring in, like if you're, if you're let's, 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 let's go with San Diego State for now. If you're San Diego State going into this year, let's say they go eight and four in the regular season in the Mountain West, which in the Pac-12 is probably the equivalent of, eh, you know, maybe five and seven, right? They lost in a somewhat competitive game to Arizona a year ago. Arizona went five and seven. So let's just say that for the sake of argument. What can you do? as a school in the portal in one year if you're suddenly a power five program with getting your roster to a competitive level you can add no less than 10 immediate impact starters there are literally thousands of players in the portal and the one of the biggest things they're looking for is an opportunity to play at the highest level possible Well, San Diego State has already taken in a good number of transfers this year. And SMU currently has the 12th best transfer portal class in the country. They're still in the American Conference. So what indication do I have that they can't maintain that sort of success or, dare I say, increase it in terms of talent acquisition if they were to suddenly be in a Power 5 conference? All the signs would point to that is certainly possible, not guaranteed. You still got to do it. You got to have the right culture in place. You got to have the right coach in place. You got to have relationships. Of course, all of that is in play. But I think the speed with which those particular programs could get up to a competitive level within five years is a heck of a lot easier. Heck, I bet they could do it in three. The old line from James Tiberius Kirk, circa Star Trek 2009, directed by J.J. Abrams, starring Chris Pine, when Christopher Pike challenges him to be a uh, to be a cadet, he says four years. It'll take you four years to be a cadet. You could be an officer. You could have your own ship in eight. And Kirk takes him up on it, and he tosses him the keys or, or tosses away the keys to his motorbike. He looks at Pike and he says, four years, do it in three." That's what San Diego State and SMU could be operating on there. So. I think they could compete a lot sooner than you quick. All of this stems from a mailbag question that, my goodness, do we have to get to. And also, what is FanDuel doing? I don't know. What are you doing without bird dog shorts this summer? I don't know. Not having as good of a summer? 
That's the only conclusion I could possibly reach. Because if you're not going out and getting shorts, which are designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and leg, giving you a truly sculpted look and are so versatile, they can be worn on a hike, in the water, on the walk, on a jog, at a barbecue, at the golf course, on a date, wherever you want, then I don't know exactly how you were trying to maximize your summer this year. Bird dog shorts do the exact same thing as Lululemon, but they fit way better. They fit better than regular shorts that are made of a stiff, restricting cotton. Bird dogs fix that issue easy money by inventing cloud knit fabric that looks just like khaki but stretches so you get a way slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement, which I am big on as a golfer. I hate restricting movement. I just, you can't do it. Messes with the swing, slows the swing speed down. Things get laggy. We don't like that but you will like your bird dog shorts. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on college for a free Yeti style tumbler with your order. That's birddogs.com slash locked on college for a free Yeti style tumbler. Mine's in the pantry. Get yours too. You don't want to take your bird dogs off this, this summer. We promise you, you will not want to do that. So go get your next order today. That was a really good second segment sip really good. We're ready to, we're ready to keep things rocking and rolling here. So, uh, this all stems from a question that came in via the mailbag, which you can always be a part of. Hit me up on Twitter at smalls underscore 55 or at LO underscore pac 12. You can also, uh, drop a comment in the YouTubes as they call it. I think that's what the kids refer to YouTube as this is from uh Nodak Millsap 81. Gotta be a relative of Paul Millsap, man. You just gotta be. Who's definitely 81 years old by now. <laughs> Which school moving conferences has the best chance of winning the conference whenever they come over, like San Diego State, possibly SMU, Texas, Oklahoma uh, in the SEC, Cincinnati, UCF, or, or BYU? Well, uh, I'm, I'm not going to pick Texas or Oklahoma. No way. Not, not a chance what I say they're the most likely. Doesn't mean it's impossible, but I don't see it. That is just not something that I see. I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm going to go with Cincinnati in the Big 12. If you look at what is left, in, and, and I would not rule out UCF necessarily either, but once Texas and Oklahoma leave to the SEC, the Big 12 has some good football brands. Baylor, Oklahoma State, TCU, Texas Tech is kind of on the up and up. Iowa State's good from time to time. Kansas State, is are, they're, they're the defending champions. They have some good teams. But what they don't have is a clear top tier of like two or three teams. So in the Pac-12 going forward, I think there's a pretty clear tier there. Right, going forward without USC and UCLA, your top football teams and programs for the last several years and going forward in the immediate future are Oregon, Washington, and Utah. I think it's pretty darn clear. You put them in whatever order you want. Once you go down to the next team, in terms of you know who's in that upper tranche of of, of elite conference contending programs year in and year out, you struck. You can make an argument. You could say, oh, it's Oregon State. They've never put together back-to-back 10-win seasons. Let's see what happens first. They could do it. I'm not saying they can't, but let's see what happens first. What about Deanna, Colorado? They haven't done anything yet. They haven't even played a football game yet. So there is a definitive void there after those top three. Whereas in the Big 12, I think all those teams are pretty close. I know TCU just had a magical season. They also beat Baylor because they ran their field goal team on without a timeout and the clock winding down, which I understand according to Sonny Dykes, they practice, but still it's not as if they were blowing everybody out, right? They had a magical season. They had a lot of close games. They ended up pulling them out and their preseason win total this year is just seven and a half. So Vegas expects them to pull back. I feel that way as well. So I don't think you have that team or program at the top that can put together a dominant season consistently. You know, Oregon's won back-to-back Pac-12 championships before. Washington has won uh, multiple Pac-12 championships, you know, two in a three-year span. Stanford even at their best. But, you know, as Stanford's a little, a little bit different now. But I, I think that's why I would go with one of those teams in the Big 12. And I lead towards Cincinnati. I know they don't have Luke Fickle anymore as their coach, but... I've seen them succeed at a high level. I think any of these programs are capable of having success. Don't get me wrong, right? I just talked about San Diego State and SMU. Of course they can, but they still have a ways to climb to get into that next level. And I think that the lowest level, I'm not saying there's no ladder to climb, 
But from a talent and just kind of program caliber standpoint, I think it's a lower ladder to climb. A lower ladder to climb. There we go. In the Big 12 compared to what you have in the Pac-12 and, and the SEC. But good question there. And the transfer portal applies to them as well. This question from Roger. Hey, Spencer, FanDuel is chasing down Shannon Sharp for talent recruitment. Interesting story there. He and Skip are done with uh, whatever their show was on F. I don't know. I never. I cannot bring myself to watch that sort of stuff. Um, as an idea for a media partner, what if FanDuel purchased the Tier 1 rights and used the Pac-12 network properties to produce the content for YouTube TV or Tubi or other free streaming platform? Sure, they could still partner with Apple or Amazon, but they better get a deal quickly because retail is dying rapidly and who needs another iPhone that does the same thing as the last model? <laughs> Apple's a trillion dollar company, by the way. They're going to be around for a little while. Even if their glasses are a hit, nobody has money for expensive tech anymore. That's kind of true. Uh, inflation is like that. Live sports is the only thing left on... Cokes, I think that's like a word for cable, I think, or Dish or Direct. ESPN is dying uh, from poor decisions in his view, so the pickings are getting mighty slim. What say you? So th this, this FanDuel thing is interesting. So they're trying to get Shannon Sharp to come over to their network because they were like a partner essentially with, uh, with, with, with Pat McAfee, whose show was broadcast on YouTube. I, I don't know exactly what FanDuel's objectives are here. Now, they are a very successful entity. We love having them as a sponsor here at the network. They are absolutely fantastic. Their product is also fantastic. That's why they're doing so well. And sports books in general are making big time money right now. So the idea, generally speaking, of, hey, what about sports books expanding their reach? What about sports books being more involved in the media space? It's not out of the realm of possibility necessarily because these companies are getting into, I, I believe, in the billions and billions of dollars of revenue. Like sports gambling is very, very, very popular. Even though it's most sports bets, the average sports bet is like four or five bucks. But when you get millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of people doing that over and over and over and over and over again, especially during football season, but on literally anything else, golf is electric for it, by the way. That is something that adds up over time and the sports books have, have done so. But I, I don't see them as being able to shift their way into the broadcast landscape here because what they're trying to do with Shannon Sharp, you know, having a personality to, you know, uh, help help kind of sponsor and run a show on YouTube, that is not the same. You know, the, the first point that I want to make here, that's not the same thing as being a broadcast media entity. The way that, you know, Apple would be new to the college football space, but Apple has broadcast live sports before. FanDuel doesn't have, I, I think they have something like FanDuel TV, but, you know, if that's where the Pac-12 ends up, yikes. But, but again, I don't anticipate that to be the case. So that, and that's the first thing is, I think that's, you know, new is okay. I think that would be a little too new for the Pac-12. But the other thing too is, we know that these talks have been going on for months and months and months and months and months. And almost certainly media entities and partner potential partners have come to the table gone out come back made different offers had discussions yada 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 all that sort of stuff i find it hard to believe that a new player like this could come in and be a part of it maybe that's why they're keeping this so secret though like if you want this idea to materialize there's you know the the bone i'll throw you here i i i can't see it happening I don't know that it's even feasible or that they, you know, have the personnel in place or the desire even as a company to move into that direction of getting into the live sports broadcasting beyond just, you know, having sports talk shows on certain channels that they're sponsoring on, on YouTube and whatnot. So I understand them going after Sharp since McAfee left them for, for ESPN, but um, I, I, I think the most likely media partners there are the ones that have been mentioned here on the show. And if you're new here, I, I, I suspect there'll be some combination of ESPN, maybe Fox, probably another cable partner, 
Don't know who that could be. Could be Ion, could be the CW, could be, I don't know, Turner, CBS. Your guess is as good as mine at this point. And then a streamer, most likely Apple, maybe Amazon. Maybe they'll have a dual streamer. Maybe it'll be ESPN and then Apple and Amazon. I don't know. I mean, nobody knows and we don't have a deal. So all, all, all we are left to do at this point in time is continue to think about what it could be because we don't know. Here's something we do know. We know that week two, much like week one, but perhaps even a little bit better, for the non-conference slate for Pac-12 football, dude, I'm telling you, it's going to be electric. So the first week, I talked about this, I think it was on yesterday's show. It might have been the day before. All the shows kind of blend together and whatnot. But every day is out there uh, know exactly what I'm talking about, more or less. Week one is going to be a great time for the Pac-12. The whole non-conference slate is, frankly. And not just because you have really good matchups and big-time opportunities against good teams and good brands that can afford the conference, you, you know, some built-in uh, strength and credibility going in conference play even more than they already have right now. But the times and the channels these games are playing on, there's just going to be Pac-12 football on that people are going to want to watch, at least, you know, diehard college football fans, at least, all throughout the day. So week one's got some great games. And then week two, again, there's a little bit more of a gap here, right? Week one, you literally have a 9, a 12, 30, a 1, a 4, and a 7, 30, all on national TV somewhere. They're really, really great matchups. But week two, and again, this stuff just came out last week, uh, and we've had other things to talk about, so I'm just getting to it. But, man, I, I tell you, this is just firing me up for the college football season so week two of college football non-conference now stanford and usc will play their uh you know traditional conference game in week two to start things off of course that'll be a think pac 12 uh, i believe pac 12 network game and that's because they both play notre dame later in the season but for the second week in a row this year you'll have Deion sanders on big noon kickoff and they will be playing Nebraska. The first home game of the Deion Sanders era. And Vegas thinks they have a chance to win that one. They're seven and a half point underdogs. I didn't say they are favored to win that one. I said they could have a chance. Vegas doesn't think they have a chance against TCU on the road. They're like a 20 point underdog. Last time I checked. But still, that game. 9 a.m. Pacific time. Early morning game. Colorado. Nebraska. Big game. Big noon kickoff. Love to see it. Then, 4 p.m. Pacific time on Fox. Sneaky good game. Oregon at Texas Tech. Not an easy game for the Ducks. On the road, tough environment, solid team. Their former quarterback, Tyler Shuck, is now the starter down there at uh, at Texas Tech. He's done very well since going there. That's going to be an awesome game. Then 4:30 on ABC. We're going to be watching. I'm going to be watching these games at the same time. Let me tell you. You got two games going at 4:30. On CBS, you have UCLA at San Diego State. That's Future Pac-12 member, I hope, San Diego State taking on the Bruins. Watch out for an upset there. That game is at Snapdragon Stadium, and UCLA does not have their quarterback situation uh, completely solidified, as I understand it. They got a lot of different guys and a lot of different names in the room, and you never know. So anyway, uh, but also at 4.30 on ABC. On ABC, I love this so much. I, I, I truly do. I truly do. Washington State which at one once upon a time, I remember when Washington State was a team you walked over in the conference, that they didn't win games, they didn't do anything at a high level, they didn't get good opponents, and here they are with a home-and-home home with the Wisconsin Badgers, and that was a huge win a year ago. Huge win in Madison. Now it swings back to Pullman. 4.30 Pacific time, ABC, it's the first Power 5 non-conference opponent in Pullman since 1998. When you talk about smaller programs building themselves up, making these sorts of scheduling arrangements, winning these sorts of games as they did a year ago, that's what we're talking about. And Washington State, big opportunity there. It was a massive win for them a season ago. I know Wisconsin ended up being just you know a 6-6 six and six football team, but still, a Power 5 win on the road, Long, long time ago, 2010, 2012, Washington State's not beating Wisconsin. They have come a long way, and they deserve credit for that, and I will always shout them out here on the show. Then in the, light, in the late night window, 
7.30 Pacific time on FS1. ASU hosts Oklahoma State. Chance for an upset there for Kenny Dillingham. It'd be a big win. I don't expect it to happen. But that would be uh, <laughs> that would turn some heads, shall we say. And at the same time on ESPN, my favorite upset pick that I've been talking about for months, I will continue to talk about Cal plays Auburn, 7.30 Pacific time on ESPN. That is a fantastic lineup of football games, start to finish. You have got fun matchups. You've got good teams. You've got great opportunities for the Pac-12. You've got them on national television all throughout the day. I am so here for it. Now, the one bummer in there is Arizona goes to play Mississippi State in another huge opportunity. They go to Starkville. It's at 4.30 p.m. Pacific time. It's on SEC Network. Darn, those conferences that have too much streaming and no exposure. Or, wait, everybody's got that element to their contract. Oh, yeah, interesting. Anyway, just thought I'd throw that out there. But I love what Week 2 brings. That Like, that lineup there, Colorado, Nebraska, Oregon, Texas Tech, Wazoo, Wisconsin, UCLA, San Diego State, and Cal Auburn. Those are my favorite games of the window. And then Arizona, the Arizona schools taking on Oklahoma State, Mississippi State. <sighs> get me to the fall. Get me to the fall. And hopefully I get you to tomorrow's show. Appreciate everyone listening. I will see you next time. And until then, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.